Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Yeah. Kind of alive. It's that first week of class is hitting you guys, isn't it? Right? No? Just me? Great. Okay, so I have a one announcement for you because I get to serve as the chapel coordinator and ministry coordinator this year. And so I want to announce that uh, me and Ben, Ben Bird back there, he does uh, a lot of the sound and a lot of the, the production team side of chapel. And so if you are at all interested in serving in tech, uh, which would be uh, working with slides, pro presenter, doing uh, sound, doing lighting, doing broadcasting in the back, if you are at all interested in those areas, uh, which would be the production team, you'll be hearing from Ben and I re, uh, here soon about how to get involved in that way. So again, if that is you, if you love that kind of stuff, if you want to grow in that kind of stuff, Ben will be holding training sessions. You can shadow him, and there's many ways you can begin to serve in that role. And so we'll be having more information on that come out soon and more uh, ways to sign up and get involved. And so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Ethan. Thank you. Thank you, John Michael. Yeah, give it up. Give it up. Okay, I have some announcements for you today. So this Thursday, men's soccer play at the University of St. Francis Cougars at 5 o'clock on Thursday. So what are we going to do to the Cougars? We're going to... Also, cross country and volleyball are competing off campus this week, so let's support them from afar or make drives to cheer them on in person. Let's support all our athletic teams this week. Drop ad is this Friday. That means it's the last day to add or drop a class before it goes on your permanent record. Bird watching at Huff Park is this Saturday. So that's going to be from 9.45 to 11.30. If you're interested in going, uh, you can talk to David Cross or email him for more information. You will meet at 9.45 in the Commons, and then the group will head out at 10 o'clock. Homecoming is coming up September 15th and 16th. There's a lot of student-focused events this year, including a disc golf tournament, a movie night, a prayer walk, an alumni soccer game with a dunk tank, high strike, a grill out, and more. Also, homecoming pickleball tournament. Love all the enthusiasm this morning. Appreciate it. So signups uh, are happening right now, and uh, spots are being filled up. So they end this weekend. If you're interested in signing up, you can sign up via email or through the DigiSigns across campus. It's $20 per pair. There is a t-shirt included, and it's all in support of David's House Ministries, which is amazing. Also, uh, this Thursday at 9.30 in the Commuter Lounge is the start of the Commuter Small Group. Uh, headed up by Stephanie Zalas. And also, speaking of small groups, Res Hall small groups start next week. Uh, they begin next Tuesday in the evening. You'll be receiving more information about that. Your small group uh, leader will be the, re uh, the RA within your Res Hall, so it's easy to remember. But more communication will come to you this week. Okay, that's all I have. Awesome. Good morning. Good morning, Grace Christian University. Oh, you guys stand with me and worship with me this morning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hello? Hello? boy <clears throat> if I had a mic I would tell some jokes if we had like
Jesus. Thank you for being patient. We might just have to do this Cornerstone. Let's do it. Um, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not try the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Corner stone, weak. 
made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. Seated. Yeah. Graduating courageous ambassador for Some courage right there. Thank you, Drake. A couple years ago, power went out the night of a, a storm right before a Sunday service at my church. Um, uh, Jim, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and come on up. Uh, and uh, we were scrambling to put pieces together. You know, this is just the reality that our voices are a wonderful instrument. So thank you, everyone, for singing. Drake, thanks for leading us in an a cappella worship um, of the Lord. I am really happy to be able to introduce Jim Shamaria for our speaker this morning. He's my pastor. He's the pastor at Celebration Bible Church. When he was a student, he was recruited by our pastor at that time to come and be part of the worship team. And Jim is uh, many things. He's a musician. He traveled with the Tommy Prophet Band back in the day. He's an athlete, he played keeper here, he still runs and cycles, and he's a pastor. Uh, he's a pastor at heart, and one of the things that I appreciate about Jim is how he ministers to our church family, and you're just as likely to see him at a youth group event, teaching high schoolers and middle schoolers, or in a nursing care facility where some of our senior saints uh, are frankly living out their last days and as he ministers to our church in this multi-generational ministry. So we're going to welcome Jim, and Jim, I'm going to pray for you, and then we'll turn it over to you. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jim. Thank you for Jim Shamaria, who is here and uh, sharing with us for what you've done in his life, for how you have worked through him and uh, given him the ability to minister to our church and now here to our school. So we pray, Lord, that you will speak through him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everybody. How are we? School's just started, so we're good, right? Okay, uh, this morning, I want to talk about a word uh, that I think sometimes is translated wrong in our Bibles. Not so wrong that it's dangerous and is like going to lead you to start like sacrificing cats or something like that, but nuanced enough that I think the way that we use English, the English language in our normal conversations uh, should lead us to think a little bit about how this word is translated, how it's used, and how the scriptures were intended for us to receive the word. Uh, and the, the word in Greek is the word thalios. And it has a brother in Hebrew, so when it'd be translated Hebrew, which is the word hafetz. Got to get a little going on with that one, so hafetz. And this word can sometimes uh, be translated as want, like what is something that you want, or I want to go here and I want to go there. 
I know at least for me, when I use the term want, when I say I want something, uh, it's often things that are kind of on the surface level of what's going on with my life, right? Like, I want a new phone, I want a new car, I want new parts for my bike, I want to be sleeping instead of being at chapel, those sorts of things, right? There's the wants that we have in our life. And I could ask you guys all that right now. What do you want? Like, what is something that you want right now? And you'd be able to list off five, six things that are kind of surface level, right? They're things that you, you, you would enjoy having, but they're just kind of right up there. But this word is also sometimes translated as desire. And when we're getting to the word desire, we're suddenly, I think, at least in the way that we use language, we're going below the surface a little bit. We're getting into the things that are deeper, right? If I were to ask you, what are the things that you desire, it's probably less likely you're going to talk about what you want for dinner tonight or what you want to do uh, this weekend. And you're going to be talking about the things behind those things, right? Your desires are the things that uh, those things aid or help or shape. So your desires are, I want to be a certain type of person. I want to have a life that's meaningful. I want to contribute to what God's doing in the world, right? I want to have a spouse or a wife or a husband or, or a partner that will help me to go forward in doing those things, right? We talk about desires. We're talking about the things behind the things. We're talking about that next level. And so this word can be translated both of those ways, as your wants and your desires. And I think sometimes when our English translations use the word want, what they really mean is desire. And it's worth making note of those things. And so I want to look at two examples this morning of that word. One is, I think, a not-so-helpful example of what it is to desire something. And one is a more healthy alternative of what it looks like to desire the things that are good and that are right. So if you have a Bible, which I'm sure you all do, uh, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 10. All right, so a little bit of context on Mark chapter 10. If you got one of these, we're on page uh, 846, if you're in the old Pew Bible. All right, a little bit of context on Mark chapter 10. This is coming at the business end of Jesus' ministry, all right? He's been spending the last few years traveling around, uh, especially up in Galilee with his disciples. Uh, he's been doing miracles, he's been teaching, he's been critiquing religious people, he's been doing all the things that Jesus is doing. But by the time we get to Mark chapter 10, it's almost as if all of that preliminary preparation stuff uh, is kind of set aside and he is now setting off with intent towards Jerusalem. And his disciples and, and his crew of disciples has seemed to be growing by the day as he travels through the towns and more and more people are kind of getting on the Jesus train as it's heading towards Jerusalem. And as they get closer and closer, the anticipation is building. Nobody knows exactly what Jesus is going to do there, except for Jesus himself. But people know that it's going to be big, and they know that they want to be a part of it. Okay? So a lot of these people have seen Jesus perform miracles. They've seen him do things that nobody else could ever do. They've seen him, like I said earlier, critique the religious leadership of the day, which was very corrupt uh, in leading people farther away rather than to God. And they're getting really excited about this because here's kind of the people's champion. Here's a guy who seems to be on their side and he can do things that no one else can do and he's speaking with the type of authority that no one else has and now he's going to Jerusalem. What is he going to do when he gets there? And some think that maybe he's going to get there and he's going to find a way to overthrow the Romans and the government that had been established there and set up a new, uh, a new governing authority there that was working for the people and not against them. Others thought that maybe he was just going to get to the temple and kick out, somehow destroy, overthrow all of the corrupt leaders that were there that were fighting against rather than for the ways of God. Other people thought that maybe he was going to get there and start some sort of revolution or riot in the city. Whatever it was, they wanted to be in on this. And especially this was true of his disciples who had been with him from the very beginning, right? So you probably know about Jesus had these, this wide group of disciples, hundreds of people that were with him. And then he had a smaller group of 72. And then from there, he had his, inner, his, his main group of the 12 disciples. And then he had the three, right? Peter, James, and John. And these were like, these were his homies. These were the guys that he did everything with. These were his closest friends. 
So this is the context, right? We're heading towards Jerusalem. The anticipation is building. The people know that something's about to happen. The disciples want to be in on what is about to go down. Two of those guys in the inner circle, James and John. So these are some of Jesus' earliest, earliest, earliest disciples, right? They've been with him since the very beginning. In verse 35 of chapter 10, it says this. And James and John, the, son of, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want for you to do for us whatever we ask of you. It's a pretty bold thing to ask Jesus, right? But did you see our word there? In the English, uh, most English Bibles, it translates this word as want. Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. But I think there's something more than just a want here. I think this is a desire. I think the better way to translate this word would say, teacher, we want you to, we desire for you to do whatever we ask. How is Jesus going to respond to this, right? How would you respond to it if somebody came up to you and said, I want you, I desire for you to do whatever I ask of you to do? Would you roll your eyes? Would you smack them? What does Jesus do? Verse 36. And he said to them, what do you want or what do you desire for me to do for you? Imagine Jesus asking you that question, okay? Especially imagine being with Jesus and seeing that he can do things that no one else can do, that he has the power to grant whatever desire you had, and for him to straight up ask you, what do you desire for me to do for you? How would you respond? What would you ask Jesus for? What is your deepest desire that you would say to Jesus, this is, this is what I desire? James and John basically have a, a blank check, right? Jesus has said, what is it? What is it that you desire? So what are they going to say? Verse 37. They said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand in glory. Okay. So, as they're getting towards Jerusalem, they know that Jesus is about to do something. They've heard all this kingdom talk. They're anticipating that he's going to establish some sort of new governing, ruling authority. And the thing that they desire is for Jesus to set them up as vice president and assistant to the vice president, right? To be kind of the two inside men, the two guys that are at the top of the food chain when it comes to the governing structure, the authority, the rule, the leadership, whatever it is that Jesus is going to do, they want to be the two guys at the top of the pyramid. Now we see this and we, it's easy for us to maybe be a little bit critical of these disciples and say, guys, come on, you're thinking about yourselves, haven't you been listening to Jesus, all this sort of thing. But I think if we're honest... We see what they're asking, and it's probably not a whole, whole, different, whole lot different than what we would maybe ask, because what is it that they want? They realize that when Jesus is ruling over the people in whatever way he's going to do, that the people who are at the top, the people who are on the inside, are going to have the opportunity to essentially control the narrative, right? They get to call the shots. Things are not going to happen to them but they are going to be the ones making the things happen. Essentially what these disciples are asking for is for Jesus to give them control, right? To give them authority over their own lives and their own destinies. They don't want to be shaped by outside forces, but they want to be the ones who are doing the shaping. And so they say to Jesus, we desire, we want to be the type of people who are at the top of the food chain. We want to be the people who are in control. And I think all of us, at different moments in our lives, sometimes more than others, have found ourselves desiring that exact same thing, right? I think especially as I look out here and I see a lot of students who are getting ready to kind of launch into the real world, whatever, that, whatever that's going to look like, you want to have a job, have a life, have a family, have a whatever, so that you can kind of control the narrative of your life. So that you can make sure things are going as you want them to go. And I know that because I'm there too, and I've been there too, and there's times when all of us want this same sort of thing. And maybe we wouldn't be so bold to say to Jesus, let us sit at your right hand in glory. But maybe we would ask that same type of question in different language. 
we want to be in control. We want to call the shots. We want to have a seat where we make things happen rather than having things happen to us. So I think this example in Mark 10 uh, is a really important example of this idea that we desire to be in control. And we ask, what is it that you desire? Left to our own devices, we all desire this. We all desire to be in control. And I don't think that's always wrong. I think there are certainly ways in which we can use influence and power and authority and whatever, whatever we have to, to make things good and to, to move forward the ways of God. But if our ultimate desire is to be privileged, in control, to call the shots, I think maybe we're missing something. So what is it that we're missing? Let's look at another example. An example that I think is a more healthy way to think about things that we desire and things that we want. So turn with me to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm 1 is like a, a top five passage for me. Uh, I, could, I could give you 40 different sermons on this psalm. It, it's just so rich and it's so beautiful and it's such a great place to start when you're digging into, what is it, wisdom and wisdom and worship. Yeah, this is, this is the place to start, right? And so in Psalm chapter 1, really what you have is you have two verses that are talking about the cause, two verses that are giving, uh, laying out two different ways to live, and then the rest of the verse, the rest of the chapter is essentially the effects of, if you choose this way, this is what your life is going to look like. If you choose this way, this is what your life is going to look like. So I'm going to focus mostly on these, these first two verses of kind of setting up the different ways of, of living. It starts like this. <clears throat> blessed is the man, or blessed is the person, Let's stop right there. The word blessed there, this is the same word. I always, I always pronounce it blessed, but has anyone ever actually said the word blessed in a conversation before? No, hashtag blessed, right? We don't do that. <laughs> blessed, that's what it should be, blessed. But it also could be translated as happy, uh, which I think is an interesting nuance to it, right? Happiness, maybe this is kind of like the joy of a Christian that is not dependent on circumstances, but it's like a deep-seated joy or happiness, right? Okay, blessed is the person, the man, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the ways of the wicked will perish. All right, so like I said, three through six are kind of the effects, but let's look back at the cause, right? There's two options here, there's two ways to live. There's the wicked way to live, and there's the blessed way to live, right? We'll come back to the wicked in a second, but we want, want to look at what does Jesus, or what does the author of the Psalms here say is the blessed way to live. The blessed person does this. The blessed person delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, it may be kind of tricky here to find our word, uh, but this word uh, that is translated in the English Bible as delight is the word hafetz, which is the word that is connected to the Greek word thelos, want, desire, okay? And in fact, this word hafetz is sometimes translated as want and desire, but it's also translated as will, like the will of God, okay? So here's our word, right? The desire of this person, his desire is in the law of the Lord. Okay, this really sounds like a Sunday school answer when we're talking about, like, what should people desire? We should desire to, to delight in the law of the Lord. But let's talk about this for a little bit. First of all, we need to make a distinction here when we're talking about the law of the Lord. For many of us Christians who are familiar with the New Testament, the writing of Paul, Galatians, all of that, we think the law is a bad thing, right? It's this heavy weight that Jesus came to free us from the law, of, of, free us from the weight of the law, all of that stuff. In this context, the law 
is the primary way that God made himself known to people, okay? So if you wanted to know who God was, if you wanted to know what God was all about, if you wanted to know what were the things that God desired, the law was access to God, right? So studying and reading and knowing the law of God was essentially knowing God himself. And the reverse of that is living in a way that you knew God loved, God desired, and made God happy. And so when the author says here that the blessed person delights or desires, his desire is in the law of the Lord, what he's essentially saying here is that the blessed person desires to know God. We tend to desire to be in control, but the Psalms tells us that the happy person, the blessed person, is a person whose deepest desire, the thing behind the thing, right? The thing that's moving and motivating and shaping you as you go through life is not control, being able to call the shots, being able to sit at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus, but the primary thing is simply a desire to know God. And it almost sounds too simple. And it almost sounds unrealistic. Like, yeah, I desire to know God, but I also have bills to pay, right? I also have these things that I want to do. I also have a job that I want to get, right? Yeah, that stuff is there. But I want to, I want to suggest that all of those things are flowing out of this, right? Knowing God is the first thing, and all of the wants, all of the needs, all of the other stuff comes from this at the core, at the center, To be rooted in this allows you to grow a tree that is fruitful and beautiful and life-giving. But it all starts with a desire to know God. So the blessed person desires to know God. And you've heard this before, right? You're at Bible college. You've heard this sort of thing before. We should all want to know God more. We should read our Bibles more. We should all do this sort of thing. And I've sat in those same seats and I've heard that stuff before. And like you, I think that's good, but it's a little bit unrealistic because I'm taking 15 credits and I have a part-time job and I have a girlfriend and I'm playing soccer and all of that stuff, right? And it seems like a really big ask to say, make your number one desire knowing God and not a new iPhone or a new car or whatever. But this text, I think, gives us two really simple entry points into that. Okay, if you're sitting here and you think, okay, that's great, and I think all of us sit here, and even the fact that you're here at this Bible college, I don't know why you're here, but at least you're here with an, with an acknowledgement in your mind that God is real, and it'd be better to know him more than to not know him more, okay? And so I think we can all at least affirm that, yeah, this sounds like a good thing, to have a desire to know God more, but I don't even know really how to start or how to create time or, or what to do here, Okay? This psalm gives us two directions, two starting points, two launching pads for how we can do that. And the first one comes in that, in that first verse, right? It says, blessed is the man who walks not. So now we're going to have the negative, right? Who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Okay, so the opposite of a blessed person who desires to know God is the type of person who surrounds themselves with people who care not about desiring God. I'm using some ESV language here because I'm using the ESV, right? The opposite of the blessed person is the person who has surrounded themselves with a community of people who are not on the same page as them when it comes to a desire to know God. So I think the first thing that this psalm points us towards when it's giving us direction on how to desire to know God more is simply this. Be in community with other people who desire to know God. Okay? So a good place to start is to be at a Bible college, right? Step one, you're here. That's a good place. You're in this bigger community. But within this bigger community, you all have your smaller communities, right? You have your groups of friends, 
You have your people who you live with in your dorm. Some of these people you've chosen, some of these people have been chosen for you. Uh, But you have these people that you're in community with. We're early in the year, and I've been uh, at Grace Christian University no long enough that this is like prime time for seeking a new boyfriend or girlfriend, right? The first two weeks, first three weeks, can I get an amen? Yeah, you all know that. You all know exactly what I'm talking about, right? This is true for this as well, okay? I'm not going to be the one that tells you that the boy or the girl that you start dating the first week of freshman year is not the person you're going to marry, but if, if that were to be the case, right? The people that you are choosing to date now, right, this applies to that as well. That is going to be your closest community in your life, both in your formative years here at college, and if you are to get married to that person, that is going to be your your closest sense of community. If you want to be the type of person who desires to know God more, make sure that you are dating somebody who also desires to know God more. Guys, if you want to date a girl who desires to know God more, you need to start desiring to know God more as well. Oh, got an amen from the sisters. Okay. Take note of that, boys. (laughs) But beyond just dating, right? The communities that you're in, the friend groups that you're creating right now, What would it look like for you to be intentional about creating a group of friends who you're all on the same page? Maybe some of you are up here, some of you are down here as far as your knowledge of God, but you all have that same desire to grow deeper in a knowledge and an understanding of him. If you were to create a community like that, you are moving in the direction of the hashtag blessed person, right? You are moving towards the type of desire that the Psalms talk about. So the first thing, don't walk with the wicked, don't sit with the scoffers, but build a community of people who also desire to know God more. And the last thing, the second thing, one of the things you have to do if you want, if you desire to know God more is you have to create space to be with God. Note I didn't say find space to be with God, but create space to be with God. The word uh, that is translated as meditate here in the scriptures uh, is a word that's sometimes used to describe a a lion kind of sitting over its prey and just slowly uh, chewing all the little bits of meat off the bone. I know that sounds kind of gross, but you imagine, right? Maybe you have a dog and you've seen a dog just gnawing on its bone and all it cares about right now is this thing in this time, right? In order to have that space to desire to meditate on the ways of God, you need margins in your life. And you're all in college, and you're all busy, and you all have stuff going on. That time, those margins are not going to show themselves. They're not just going to bubble to the surface, and you're going to be sitting around one day and say, hey, I have 20 minutes right now. I think I should read my Bible, right? You're going to go play Halo, or we don't play Halo. What do we play now? Whatever you guys... Fortnite, okay. (laughs) Fortnite. (laughs) All right. You have to be people who are willing to create. And I say you, I mean myself too. I have to be the type of person who creates time in my life to be present with God, right? That means that sometimes I schedule time in my day So that if somebody calls me and says, hey, pastor, can you meet me here for lunch? Or, hey, pastor, can we do this? I say to them, no, I can't. I don't have to tell them why. I just say, no, I can't. Because I've scheduled time in my life to be present with God. I want to show you something. I brought this book with me. This is my, uh, my, my blessed book, my desire book. I don't know what you call it. I just made that in Tamara. This is the book I use. I get a new one of these every day, every year. And I use it to every day. Super blessed. Okay. But this is it, right? I don't have volumes of this, but I try to spend 15 to 20 minutes, okay? Not an hour, not two hours, 15 to 20 minutes a day reading scripture and in prayer. If you flip through this, you'll notice that there's some blank pages, right? Each of these is a week. 
There are some weeks that I don't do it, that I fall off the wagon, right? There are some weeks that I, I can't, I didn't make the time, or in this case, I was at the pastor's conference, right? When you're at a pastor's conference, you don't have time to read the Bible, apparently. Uh, right? I fail at this as much as I succeed. But I try to get back on, right? I try to start up again the next week. And this is one of the things that I always struggled with when I was your age is feeling like I can't commit to a daily devotion routine or something like that because I'm going to fail. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up. I'm going to miss some days. And if I miss some days, I might as well not even do it altogether, right? The trick to being people who desire to know God, who create space to be with God, is being faithful with it and graceful with it, right? Faithful with it in that you keep it up Graceful with it that when you mess up, when you miss, when you skip a week or a day or a month, you realize that God doesn't love you any more or less, and that there's always a chance to get back on it again. But you have to create that space. It is not going to show itself. This is the time in your life, more than any other time, to begin building those habits. Habits I wished I would have built when I was your age and not 15 years ago, 10 years ago. I guess I was your age 15 years ago, 10 years ago. But to build those habits now, that is the step to being the type of person who desires to know God. So we'll leave with this question, the question that we started with. What do you desire? What is the thing behind the thing in your life? And if it's not knowing God more, what do you need to do to step in that direction? What do you need to do to be that type of person who's like a tree planted by the river, who yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves never wither? That person's blessed. And that's the type of person that I think we all want to be. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the gift of scripture. We're grateful for the way that it offers us bad examples, examples that we can relate to, examples of selfishness and control and power, yet equally shows us a better way to live, a more beautiful way, a more fruitful way, a way more in line with how you designed us to be. I pray for each of these students in here. I pray for myself, for all the teachers and faculty and staff that we all become people who more and more desire to know you, that we continue to build a foundation and that we do the intentional work of creating a community of people and creating space in our life that will help us to desire to know you more. May this be the semester that changes the lives of these students. May this be a semester where they form these habits, where they find these friends, where they begin to create the space in their life to be people who desire you. We pray this in your name. Amen. At my church, we say grace be with you, and you say also with you. So grace be with you. Now get out of here.